To start off with, uh, how, were you born in Ashby? I was not, Harold. I, I was not born here. I was born in Bristol, Connecticut. And I lived in four different states before I lived in Ashby. Uh, my father was a, um, an itinerant uh, manager, and he tried a lot of different uh, employment positions before he found this area. I was a city boy before I came here. I had two years in Quincy, and I was a very urban, uh, indoctrinated member of the Ashby uh, citizenship. Now, how old were you when you moved to Ashby? I was 11. 11. I, I came here in 1955, which makes me kind of old in the general population now. but. I am not an original, and in order to be a native Ashby person, you have to have three generations before yourself. Uh, oh, at least. At least, yes. <laughs> now, was it kind of a culture shock moving from a city environment to way out here in the boonies? Absolutely. I, um, uh, we lived on, at the foot of Town Hill um, next to a brook, and I was not ready for the quiet. It was the only sound of a gurgling water sound, and I couldn't sleep. I was absolutely unsettled as far as the change in the environment. I, I was uh, um, alone. Basically, there were no people visible from our house um, where we had lived on in a city block next to the expressway, mm -hmm. where the oil tanks are. Right, right. And just down the road from Dunkin' Donuts, the original Dunkin' Donuts. So I was, I was uh, able to walk to school up the main street uh, or take a bus uh, and go down to the library in Quincy Center. There was just so much that was absolutely culturally uh, a, a bi bilateral connection. <laughs> Now, you were saying it was too quiet and uh, you just heard like the sound of the water. Um, I personally love to fall asleep to that. Did you ever get used to that though and come to like it or? I can't say I ever um, really loved the brook. There were so many things about it that were a problem. If it rained, it would get very full and it would threaten to flood our cellar. Uh, if it was dry, there wasn't enough water in our shallow well. We had an 18-foot well, and we'd run out of water in the summer. Mm. So it was, it was so, so, so different uh, to live next to the brook, and I can't say I ever really felt it was uh, ideal. Now, growing up as a teenager here, though, did you come to enjoy the woods as you got older or the, the more rural nature of the town? My father had an ambition for me. That would be that I was a farmer. And that's partly why he picked Ashby as our next residential opportunity. Um, he thought that I would, uh, I would grow into the local population, which was farming. It was agriculture. Mm. At that time, Ashby had three agricultural fairs. Um, basically, the underlying uh, culture of Ashby was the, the rural um, grow your own chickens and, and um, produce and cows and things that were um, pretty economically viable mm -hmm. then too. So did, did your family and most of the families in town just do all their shopping basically locally through the farms that were here for vegetables and milk, for example, and things like that? We got our eggs from Mrs. Ilmery, just down the road from our house. Um, we got a lot of the, the things that we ate, including the 
raspberries in the summer, which I grew to really dislike because that's how I had to do morning and night picking. And raspberry season, which lasts three weeks in summer when theoretically a young person is off, it's not so. Mm. You're out there a couple hours um, getting a couple of cans of raspberries, and then you sell them by the side of the road, and you eat a lot of them and make jam. And I also had rabbits and chickens and sheep, and I basically helped us get through a pretty lean time for mm -hmm. our family income. How did you find going to school in Ashby? And where exactly was school in Ashby for you? Well, Ashby school was uphill in both directions. It was one of those places that uh, was a challenge to get to, a challenge to come home. It was a couple miles. We weren't eligible for a bus drive. So in the winter and in the worst weather, when they just often decided to have school, because it wasn't as easy to call off school back in those days, um, I'd walk up the hill in the snow and the ice, and our class was 32 people. It was a relatively um, a radically different experience than my first and uh, up to fourth grade in Quincy. Mm where there were, it was a major downtown school. There were a number of grades, the second grade, the third grade, the fourth grade, there were three classes of the same grade. And in Ashby, there was one grade and it was pretty under, uh, under studentized. Mm -hmm. It was basically a, um, a very small environment. We had, they were closing down the, the trade shop that was in the basement where they used to, have woodworking and they had heavy equipment down there. I missed out on that, but they did still have the typing room where they taught young women to be secretaries, and I didn't get to go to that. I was in the college program, uh, so I learned French with Mrs. Willett, Miss um, Willett, and I had Colin Bourne for education, uh, English. Uh, I had Latin, I had um, music with Clark Green. It was a lot of local personalities mm -hmm. that I think probably were good for my my exposure to knowledge because um, they were very personal and they took an interest in each individual in a way that I think many teachers can't. So there was an advantage to going to school in Ashby, but there was also a really limited curriculum and, uh, for instance, the things that were available in sports. There was basketball, um, some baseball, no football. Not that I would have done any of those, but there was there was a limited option. Now, did you take part in any of the sports in town? Never. Not into that? Never, no. Um, I felt totally inadequate with a baseball in my hand, never mind trying to do something with it. Um, my father bought me a baseball glove that he told me I would throw the ball up against the wall and bounce, it would bounce, and then I'd catch it and I'd learn to be a good baseball player. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen. I mean, I did bounce the ball up against the barn door for a while, but it didn't make me a great baseball player. Now, was it possible to you, for you to like to bike to school or was it always walking to school or what were the even roads like back then? I had a bike, but you'd find it very difficult to come up downhill on a bike in the ice mm -hmm. or the bad weather of any sort. Yeah. Um, I, it, and bikes weren't necessarily, um, there, was a, there was a standard for how you could be your age, and one of them wasn't you ride a bike to school. Um, that wasn't uh, in the parameter. Uh, my father, when we brought when he brought us here, he thought um, he was extraordinarily conservative. He was a John Birch uh, member of the conservative group in Ashby at that time. Mm -hmm. We were we had a strong 
conservative population. Um, and my father got right into that. He wanted me to uh, behave as if um, I was um, in uniform. So he gave me the, the rule that I would have to wear a tie to school. Uh, I started off uh, almost two months uh, wearing a tie to school in the fifth grade. That wasn't the normal school attire back then, though, right? Uh, it was so un unpleasant <laughs> and unacceptable. And it marked me as um, a pariah for the rest of my life in Ashby, possibly, wow. but uh, certainly with my classmates at that time. So w with the smaller class sizes and just smaller population, was there much opportunity for socializing in town back then? or? I had a clique of people that I got along with that um, it was part of my um, survival skill, I guess, that there were people that I could call friends um, that um, I spent time with in and out of school. Uh, so there were social opportunities and it was it was not the basketball players. It was not the um, the athletic kids. Um, it was, um, some would say it was the losers. Mm -hmm. Now, since Ashby doesn't have really much of entertainment even today, as far as music venues or movies or anything like that, would you often go down to, say, Fitchburg to to see movies on Main Street when that was when there was a movie theater there and stuff or we weren't very mobile um, my father had a car that he didn't rely on um, it wasn't very predictable but we didn't have money for gas we didn't have money for movies we didn't have um, the the resources for um, m m m I guess professional entertainment. We did have uh, the town fairs. We had um, the church. <clears throat> I was a Congo congregational um, Sunday school person, and uh, they had the band concerts. They had the um, the f fair days, like July Fourth mm -hmm. uh, or the event days um, that. The, the the bonfire was um, um, an event that I did go to. That was entertainment. Yeah, talk about that a little bit more. What were the bonfires back like then? Uh, like today, we we stack up uh, wood pallets for like 60 feet high and 20 feet square. What was it like back then? What did they use? Well, the shape of it was pretty similar, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't necessarily composed as homogeneously <laughs> as as now. It was lots of different stuff in there that they'd fill up the core of it with whatever happened to burn and they wanted to get rid of. Uh -huh. uh, so there was on top of it a, a real outhouse. The Ashby still had people who had outhouses then. And if you were unlucky enough to get noticed and to lose your outhouse, you had some inconvenience for a little while because that was some people's um, major alternative uh, for sanitary facility. Were they, did someone just go around taking an outhouse, you mean? Or? They'd steal an outhouse for the bonfire. Oh. Well. That was a, there were several uh, traditions that um, kind of got abandoned over the years. One of them was that we would collect um, things from people's yards and put them on the common for um, public demonstration. You had to come and get your manure spreader um, if it happened to end up on the common uh, for 4th of July preview. Um, was that like the beginnings of like public shaming type things? Or? It, was a, it was a practical joke. It was oh. like taking their outhouse. It was considered a prank and it was um it was supposed to be good fun mm -hmm.
Now, when I, this is the first time it's public knowledge, but uh, when I um, purloined Frida Lyman's bird bath, that was uh, uh, astonishingly a bad move. <laughs> that didn't go over so well? <laughs> it was, it was uh, nearly the cause of a police investigation. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, were the bonfires as big of a deal then as far as the number of people that would show up? And I would say yes. I think um, it was a different sort of event because it was, it was much like um, one of the, the fairs. It was uh, kind of a group activity to make the bonfire a, a fun thing. Mm -hmm. And there were... Um, there was a barbecue that was wonderful. Ellen, Elwin Shepherd was the uh, chief uh, master chef for the barbecue, and he had a secret sauce that he put on the chickens, and they cooked them just right mm -hmm. on these very large uh, mobile pits that they had for that purpose. Uh, and that was probably one of the highlights of the year to get some of Elwin's chicken. Mm. Yeah, that was something I'm sure a lot of people wish they had this year. There was no food this year for that. So, I believe that it was key to all of the events that people came at least partly because they had homemade uh, whatever, uh, the, the bakery stuff. The, there were a lot of, we raised money for our high school senior trip by selling food out here in front of the library. Oh. And there was a lot of, income from that. Now, do you remember there being parades in town? Uh, the library had a an old 16 millimeter uh, movie of the one of the anniversaries of Ashby, where it was a huge parade out front uh, with floats and uh, the Bernhards had a had a band float where people were playing on. Do you remember that event or? Well, the the Bernhards were certainly a key uh, spark plug for just about everything. The concerts, they'd bring the, the wagon up. The, uh, it had hamburgers and hot dogs and uh, some other food in, in the cart. And he'd tow it up here with his tractor before the band mm -hmm. concert. It was part of the event in just about every case. Um, they were um, also key in the in the church uh, making pies and just having um, a lot of um, leadership in uh, producing enough stuff so people really had a great meal or mm -hmm. a great uh, incentive to come back. It was, um, I think, one of the parade features that they put a lot of energy into having it be a big deal. And the the uh, the women's um, legion, mm -hmm. the American legion, the women's legion, they'd have cars and uniforms. And uh, when I first came to town, probably the second year I was here, I decorated my bicycle because they had a contest, and you would uh, I put uh, paper uh, cray paper mm -hmm. on the wheel and. Um, just made it look red, white, and blue. It was an old Columbia, weighed tons. And, right. and uh, it still was a prize winner. I got a second or a third prize, I don't know, but mm. it was a little income too. So that was important for, for a lot of the events. There was a chance. The fairs, I entered at least partly because I could win uh, money. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the band concerts? Uh, I've heard from others that you know, for the decades that the band concerts have been around, those were used as a big socializing event for people to be able to talk about town politics and just catch up on news and stuff. Uh, was that something that you often went to? or? I think it was primarily, um, for me, uh, boring. <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of the politics happened in uh, circles like Irving Miller's 
garage. They had a he had a wood stove in there, and the um, the heavy duty politically interested people would come and sit around. There'd be mm, ten guys mm -hmm. sitting around the wood stove for hours, um, talking about what should be in Ashby. Now, were these like the people that were actually on various boards and in government or just their <sighs> everyday citizens? Well, there isn't a lot to government in Ashby. I mean, the select people are, there's three of them. Mm. Um, they are probably the most uh, flexible as far as having a political impact. And th that was a pretty fixed group. Um, the the kinds of things that came up were whether we should have a regional school. And that was a, a major factor um, in political discussion uh, because it was going to change the taxes and it mm -hmm. was going to change, um, in a way, the economy. So that was quite, quite a political football. Now, were you yourself ever involved in town politics or in any capacity? Well, in, in that time, I actually uh, had a, a speech when we graduated, and I advocated for the strength of a school like Ashby's that was uniquely a town experience. So I spoke to that. Mm -hmm. uh, my father often took a strong position at town meetings. And uh, he, was, he was recognized in town. He joined the fire department. He basically built a, um, a visibility for himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a little bit of that shadow. Um, I since um, have taken some responsibility for the finance committee, for the board of health, uh, for, well, the Energy Efficiency Committee. Mm -hmm. I'm still the recycling coordinator by title until somebody tells me I'm not. Um, that's, those are all things that I think I do, at least partly because it helps Ashby. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the school, when you were here all through high school as well, right? You graduated to Ashby High School. Um, and you had talked about working on on, far, on your farm. Did you have any other jobs off the farm or? My first job, um, I was only 12, I think. I, I worked for Frida Lyman right over here on, in the big house. And this was a garden right out here. Oh, right and, outside the windows And here? I was often assigned to, to weed in the garden. And Frida would sit up there with binoculars and see uh, what I was doing. And that was an experience um, to, to have that first uh, exposure to um, how you, I got 50 cents an hour, and how you w work um, was very strongly influenced by Frida. Now, was uh, that a commercial farm? I mean, that was no. sold or just her own private? No, it was uh, um, It was a survivor of the time in Ashby when the Lymans were the core of the economics. Um, they were, that house was um, like the plantation oh. that everybody circulated around, um, I think. Uh, but the the next job I did was Don White's, the gas station. And that was another kind of experience. I also did, uh, during the summer then, um, the tool and die. Uh, and I learned something about production and how I didn't fit that well. <laughs> well, the tool and die that's just up Main Street here? On yes, and I, I was, my assignment was to cut... Um, a blank for a die mm -hmm. and do it over and over bin after bin and that was a, a strong encouragement to figure out another way to make a living. Now what were some of the 
most positive things about growing up in Ashby. I mean, I, I know it was a sh culture shock moving here from the Quincy area, which I can imagine is uh, a drastic change. I mean, having grown up in New Jersey myself, which is also an extremely densely populated area, coming to here was a big change. Um, but what were, what were some positive aspects about Ashby that you enjoyed? I believe the values that I learned um, trying to be agricultural, um, trying to be um, flexible, mm -hmm. and trying to be independent were all things I carry now that, that were life valuable. And I think Ashby in and of itself, um, the culture here was supportive. They basically said, okay, you live here, you were gonna accept you. Oh, that, that was my next question is when, when you had moved here with your family, did you find Ashby to be an accepting community to, uh, from, for outsiders, especially people who came from a more city environment and were new to the whole culture of a rural area? That's a complicated question. I think Ashby has always had its internal strife, its internal uh, subgroups that are to some extent confrontive. And I think our politics are an example. We've had um, huge clashes over things like a powerful police chief um, that split the town virtually in half or the librarian conflict that we came up to, mm. um, that um, are examples of the, the complexity of the population and the, the fact that it is, um, it's, a, it's a learning experience in um, f hearing and seeing different points of view. Now, you kind of touched upon the community aspect of Ashby. Did you find Ashby to be a close-knit community, or did everybody kind of keep to themselves, or were you, how would you view that? I'm pretty sure that uh, Ashby couldn't have existed at that time without cooperation. There were people that were always helping somehow. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Kendall Crocker, um, the stock farm, um, there, there were people who were town leaders who were also accepted across the board, no matter what your politics was. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were also economic anchors for the community, and, and that gave Ashby a kind of a sense of identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that being from Ashby was a proud thing. You could say, I'm from Ashby and mean it. Right. Now, getting back to Ashby, uh, growing up in the in Ashby, do you remember the the winters being more severe than they are now, or <laughs> what was that like? Well, that was a lot of shoveling. I mean, <laughs> that was just, I don't know what happened to the snow, but back then, there were times it was three feet outside our house, mm. and you'd you made a, an aisle out. And it was only uh, 15 feet from our front door to the street. But you couldn't see anything <laughs> on the sides <laughs> right. um, when, you, when you made that path. It was, it was just a lot of um, precipitation. It was good for my garden. It was good for... Um, a lot of reasons, not climate change. Uh, it was pretty. Um, it was pretty expected that mm -hmm. they they were set up to do road clearing and and they got got it done pretty reliably. They they were, I think, respected. The town crews, the the general management of the weather worked, even though it wasn't a big income. Uh, uh, there wasn't enough money for it. They still had committed people who made it happen. So you remember the town taking good care of the roads and you could actually get out after a storm? I went to school. Yeah. I walked up there. 
What about uh, the uh, growing up? Did you use the churches in town, or was that a part of your life on the common, which is right behind us? <laughs> um, it. My father was um, uncommitted as far as um, the Protestant uh, selection of faiths. So I was a Presbyterian, I was a Episcopalian, I was uh, a Baptist, a little, he, he experimented with lots of uh, churches in Ashby mm -hmm. as well as in Quincy. And I was Congo and Unitarian. Uh, my, my earliest experience was the Sunday school at, at the Congo Church, and Mrs. Peterson, uh, whose husband also did the, um, the he was a, a science teacher who worked down at the, in, in Fitchburg at the store where they sold science equipment. He sold beakers and Petri dishes and tubing and all hmm. sorts of things that I love to um, I did chromatography as a as an, a science experiment to be in the science fair, and he got me a lot of the stuff that I needed to be an early chromatographer. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the year you moved here? It was forty fifty five fifty five. Yes. Now, what about like the were there still things like party lines on the phones and? Yes, we had a party line, and that was one of my. Um, my parents greatest um, irritations there were a lot of long talkers on our um, group there were about seven people in a group um, so seven, seven people with the same telephone number when you pick or with the same line so when you pick up the phone if somebody's talking you can't call and you had to compete with seven people yes Seven households. Seven households. Was there any, did the people that were on that, on that party line, did they ever like cooperate and say, hey, I got it from six to seven and you can take it from five to six or? No, there was no such. No uh, such thing? To my knowledge, no. Uh, it was occasionally confrontive. Oh, it didn't make for, for friendly. I've got to use the phone. Right, right. Get off. And on a party line, you can hear them as crystal clear as if you're talking, if you're doing the talking to your own connection, right? Correct. Oh. So there wasn't a lot of heck of a lot of privacy, I bet then, huh? It it was not uh, secure, you might say. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's not like today's cell phone technology, that's for sure. Now, what were, what were the sources of news in town, for example? Was there a town newspaper, or was it mainly word of mouth, or how, how would you consider it back then I don't believe it was any better than than it is now there is no standard reference mm -hmm. for media now and certainly not then right the best probably was word of mouth mm -hmm. um, that people talked to each other they met in church they met at the grocery store at, uh, at the Ashby General Store at Burnaps uh, they'd see each other and talk yeah, you just mentioned the the store in town. Was that a was that a hub of activity, so to speak? I mean, was that a place where people would go and hang out and and talk about things? And you'd meet people for sure. Yeah, um, I'd go there to buy my mother's cigarettes. <laughs> um, they 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 were twenty five cents a pack, and you could, as a twelve year old, you could get. A pack of cigarettes. Mm. So, it there was also penny candy. There was um, all the produce that we used for the most part during the winter came from the Ashby Market. Um, another thing that was they had a great butcher option, mm -hmm. so we had a lot of hamburger from them and uh, salt pork. My mother's fallback menu had. Uh, Boston baked beans on it and she'd need salt pork for the well, baked beans so we bought a lot of salt pork from the Ashby market. Oh uh, growing up through the 50s and 60s was there uh, could you get any TV up here I mean there was certainly obviously no cable back then but uh, were you able to get any 
over the air channels and for any kind of entertainment at all or news or it was all over the air there was no cable sure and uh, our television was uh, one of those console kinds of things that oh, had yeah. a record player and a radio yep. um, and a very small screen that was reliant on tubes vacuum tubes so Oliver Much who was our uh, local and not just for us but for the whole town the technician who could make your TV work mm -hmm. and it was a, re a constant requirement that you needed a new tube uh, that the thing would go all wavy and you couldn't see anything and you'd call up Oliver and he'd come over and get there and a couple of weeks and they'd have a five dollar vacuum tube and off to watch things again for a while. We had 33 records. Um, my, my favorites were musicals back then. My first 45 was um, Snow White Dove that I could play on that machine. Mm -hmm. And it was, that was entertainment for us. The, the likelihood is I could still give you a lot of the lyrics of Oklahoma and <laughs> Showcoat. Now what about radio? Was that a big part of uh, entertainment as well? Radio was was there. I was a I had a little silver tone that my grandmother gave me. It was brown and it had tubes too. Mm -hmm. um, and I could listen to Voice of Firestone. Uh, there was um, a lot to be said for um, for me, for the morning uh, news, and you could kind of keep track of what was going on by listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what other kind of things uh, that we haven't talked about? Would you like to include anything else? Or and we'd get gasoline by going uh, around the area and getting deposit bottles that were on the side of the road. Glass bottles, five cents. You could put together three dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, without mm, three or four hours work. Um, gas was 25 cents, was mm, virtually nothing right. per gallon. And you could, I could get enough gas um, to go ride around uh, besides take my mother to work mm. uh, when she was at work. <laughs> but, I can imagine having a car was a in in a town like Ashby was gave you a lot more freedom. It was necessary. Yeah. It was really necessary. You could you couldn't uh, survive on a bike <laughs> after fifteen. No, no. Yeah, everything is uh, pretty far away, and Ashby's very high. There are a lot of hills to climb, and <laughs> well, it's it's thirty six miles of road. Mm. Um, so to go from my house to my girlfriend's house was nearly 10 miles. Yeah, that's just within the same town, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. He, yeah, going from the Fitchburg border up to up to Allen Field is like, I think, about eight miles. That's right. So all within the same town. But it, with all that geographic area, we still only have about, I think it's like 3,300, 3,500 people in town, somewhere around there. So well, back then it was out. under 1,000, it was right. 900. So wow, um, it was very, very widespread population. Now back in the 50s, do you remember this area being actually less wooded than it is now? Because it's my understanding that Back then, a lot of the a lot of the trees were, had been cut down for farming and you know f hay fields and things like that, and it's actually more filled in now than it was. It was a uh, strip of lumber, mm. uh, but that was in the 1800s that they really got that um, level of mm -hmm. uh, clearing. Where we live now in Ashby, up on West Road, was all fields and the stone walls are an example of what used to be fields and they're everywhere in Ashby right and those are the um, the stock farms and the um, for us up in where I live 
blueberries. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was their resource for summer income. The Finns had a co-op, and they would originally do blueberries, uh, cartons, cases, train loads, boxcar loads of blueberries that they sent to Boston. That was kind Coming of the, from Ashby? the foundation of uh, collective behavior here in Ashby, which got them in trouble, of course, because they were, uh, I won't use the word lightly, they were socialists. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't communists, but they had cards, a number of them said they were communists, uh, because the Finns came from their home country with a different standard of cooperation. Mm -hmm. And the Fitchburg Co-ops, the United Cooperative Farmers, um, the both the grocery store, the bank, and the, the feed operation, which was also a poultry processing operation, originally handled the blueberries. And they would mass market uh, and then spread that income back to the people that contributed. Wow. Uh, and that led to major problems. When we came to town, it was the height of the McCarthy era, mm -hmm. and they were uh, devastating the the local population of people who um, were vulnerable to that. Now, in in what way was it devastating? I'm a little confused on that point. The house that we moved into was a Finnish person's house who had that designation. They discovered that he had a, a card, and they offered to tar and feather him. Wow. He sold his house for a fraction of its value to my father. Wow. I didn't know about that kind of history. There's lots of uh, buried history in Ashby. The, the response to the prohibition that brought a lot of distillers to Ashby. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were uh, ample evidences of uh, independence mm -hmm. here, and that's partly the, the conservative foundation, too. You were instrumental in the transfer station set up and the end of the dump. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> there, well, I mentioned Elwyn Shepard back a while ago, and Elwyn was the person who managed the, the dumps. There was an original dump um, kind of across the road and down the hill from the place we use now as the transfer station. And Elwyn had a giant pile of metal and a hillside where people threw their stuff over. And I'd go over there with a 22 and we'd shoot rats, um, basically entertainment uh, for the young and uh, purposeless. Place that Elwin earned as uh, the um, materials manager in town eventually brought him to the Board of Health. And Elwin was um, a strong advocate for managing that stuff more responsibly. He'd often try to sell the metal and have trouble, and he earned more uh, consideration as a manager as he became more aware of the problems with putting stuff in piles. There was drainage. There was uh, toxic materials that were uh, going into the watershed uh, that goes down along, uh, along the road from the transfer station now. And he encouraged me to take notice of uh, better ways of Ashby managing their stuff. At the same time he was uh, encouraging, there was an effort to have an incinerator here in Ashby. It was a trend, well, in the Northeast to look for tax relief by having uh, an incinerator in your town because the, the people that were building those facilities promised that they would give the town a major income. They'd be an economic resource and it would solve some of Ashby's tax problems. 
the Department of Environmental Protection back then was a fan of regional solutions for waste management because they were beginning to discover that they couldn't have landfills without having uh, small landfills without having pollution. So there was an effort to have an incinerator. I did a lot of research because I didn't know. And I learned that in the small incinerators are a very bad economic uh, decision. They aren't viable. They can't operate successfully over time. So for Ashby to give them initial tax incentives in order to have that facility here was the wrong thing. So I became active to oppose the incinerator. And that's what started me off in paying more attention to how we manage stuff here. We set up a, a volunteer process to have recycling as part of the transfer station, as part of what was then a dump, but also a place where you could source separate and have your glass go into a, a barrel or a, we had tractor trailer uh, abandoned past, past use um, storage for glass and paper and some kinds of plastic. And that was our start for having a, a recycling program, having more attention given to how we took care of stuff here. And then we basically put together um, a, a, a local group that also cared about energy. Because at that time, I was also getting invested in fundamental action to conserve energy as a career in Fitchburg. And that gave me a whole other agenda for not only saving stuff, being a material manager, but being a little more concerned with land management, with water management, and uh, with energy management. So Ashby at that time had mm, pretty much a, the same knowledge, the same public knowledge of issues like um, conservation that um, needed to be better paid attention to. So we put together uh, a volunteer group that uh, started the, the Ashby change from a dump to uh, separate facilities. Alan Murray worked hard on that and took a commercial interest in it and basically became what uh, turned out to be the designer of the facility we currently have in Ashby. And that was a, uh, an effort that also involved capping the landfill because that was a state requirement. So we had to spend money on that and we had to figure out how we were going to do that. And we had a group of people that took an interest in making all that happen in a way we could afford. The, the transfer station uh, became a, a, a fixture. It became a, an institution. ARCTS, the Ashby Recycling and Transfer Station, uh, got a place in the budget. It got, a, it got institutionalized. And currently we we spend about $50,000 a year. Maybe I shouldn't say that because <laughs> some people don't realize it costs that much that recycling doesn't pay for itself because that was another myth that was very strong back in those days. If we recycle, we won't have to pay for throwing things away. And the change here in Ashby has still a ways to go. We still have a lot of work to do to get uh, a better public attention to how we manage our stuff and how we manage our energy. The Energy Efficiency Committee started um, in uh, the late 1900s, 
uh, because we we had people like Bob Higginsteel uh, that was that were leading public knowledge about uh, passive solar water heating, and he built one for his house, and people noticed, and he wanted to talk about it. So Bob became um, um, an original member. There were others that wanted to be more publicly available for information about energy efficiency. And it fit with my agenda because of FACE, Fundamental Action to Conserve Energy, was still in my career. And the, the general idea got contributed to by uh, people like Jim Hubert who came from Groton with knowledge about the general agenda of being energy conscious. He was, um, he was commercially a service provider in that sector. And with that kind of contribution, Ashby became a green community. We filed and succeeded in bringing a reasonable amount of money in um, it, that's now still going on to spend on making our buildings more efficient. This room right here is more efficient than it was when it was originally built because of a, um, basically a, um, an investment by the state and the town to improve the building, to make it l cost less to have this building, to cool it, to heat it, to ventilate it. It is happening at the town hall, at the schools, at all of the town buildings because of the Energy Efficiency Committee and the amount of time that they and energy that they've invested as volunteers. Um, there's six people on that committee right now. Um, some of them original, some of them turnover, but the, the fact is people are willing to still work on it. For one reason, it saves us money. It saves us money because it brings in outside resources and it saves us annual expenses in oil and gas and electricity. That's, that's all <laughs> just a small piece of my um, passion about energy efficiency. <laughs> Good. That's an important topic nowadays. Gas isn't forty cents a gallon anymore. It's now four dollars a gallon. So. And and it's a major issue as a fossil fuel and the fracking that we pay, don't pay attention to, mm -hmm. which is also causing both national and international problems. Absolutely. So I mean, there's just so much to um, pay attention to that we don't have a great. Uh, resource for education because there's a lot of controversy being introduced with misinformation. Absolutely. Well, Bill, it's, you've provided a ton of great history on yourself and the town. Um, it's been wonderful hearing what it was like growing up in Ashby and, and everything that had gone on in the past. And we greatly appreciate your time in, in, informing everybody about the history of the town. So it's all much appreciated. Well, Harold, I think it's a wonderful project. I'm grateful that you've invested time and energy in helping it uh, become a reality, become uh, something that will uh, be an asset for the future as well as uh, re recognizing the past. Mm -hmm.